Uh, it is Palm Sunday, and so we read from John chapter 12 to begin with, and then we'll be reading also from another passage in Philippians. But we read the story of John uh, from, from John's gospel with Jesus in the triumphant entry. His ministry is reaching a climax. He has just recently raised Lazarus from the dead. And that has gotten everyone's attention. The Pharisees are on edge. They are now plotting to kill him. The other people in Jerusalem are now uh, taking notice and they're coming to worship him because now, whoa, this is serious. This is a big deal. This may be the, tr the true Messiah. What does this mean? And so crowds of people are gathering and they are preparing to welcome him as he enters in to Jerusalem from Bethany. We pick up in verse 12 of John 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it was written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. So we see a crowd of people uh, coming to worship Jesus, coming to lift him up, coming to magnify him, coming to, to welcome him and celebrate him as he comes in to Jerusalem. But the crowd was in a very much different place than Jesus was, weren't they? They had a very different expectation of what Jesus was about to do and who Jesus was about to become. The praise of the proud was true, yet it was false. The crowd was disconnected from his, his intentions and even his fate. And we see that as they worship him, they think one thing and he is doing something else. They're following him, but they're not really following him at all. Because they don't know what it's about to take place. And in fact, some of them in the crowd are actually going to be a part of the crowd later in the week that calls him to be crucified. They were following an idea of him. But they weren't truly following him. They were following their idea of him through their Jewish paradigm. What they expected him to be as the Messiah wasn't who he really was as the Messiah. Oh yes, he was the Messiah, but not in the way that they expected it. How many people today follow their idea of Jesus instead of who Jesus truly is? How many people today follow their paradigm of who they think Jesus is. You see, for them, they were following a, a Jewish paradigm of who the Christ was. How many people today follow an American paradigm of who their Christ is in their minds? But you see, Jesus surprises everyone, doesn't he? Even his own disciples throughout the course of this week, his trajectory takes a downward direction. We find Jesus Christ there on mission. And it wasn't the mission that anybody expected him to carry out. The music that they played and sung, singing Hosanna and the celebration, unfortunately was void of any suffering or sacrifice. That was required of Jesus. They were celebrating the Messiah. They were celebrating a gift. Yet they, had, they were disconnected from the cost of the gift. Whenever you receive a gift from someone. 
whether great or small, whenever you receive a gift from someone, maybe at Christmas time or on your birthday or on your anniversary, whenever you receive a gift, it always costs someone else something, doesn't it? Whenever you're forgiven by someone, whenever you receive forgiveness, it always costs someone else something, doesn't it? And you see the people here in Jerusalem, they were celebrating a Messiah in their minds, but they were disconnected from the cost. They did not realize what their salvation would cost God. Do we realize what our salvation cost God? Do we have a connection to the suffering and the sacrifice and what it cost our Lord and Savior to forgive us of our sins and to save us and to cleanse us, to make us whole? Are we connected with that suffering? Are we connected with that cost? Do we appreciate the value of our salvation and what God was willing to go through? You see, that's what Good Friday is about for us. That's why we believe in having Good Friday services here at this church. Because we believe in taking time to connect ourselves with the suffering and the loss and the cost that Jesus went through to save us, to forgive us. As we, we think about this downward trajectory that Jesus went through after this moment, it's, very, it's the opposite of what our world would expect of a king. It's the opposite of what the Jewish people would expect of their Messiah. You see, every point of reference in history that they ever had was of a conquering hero, right? A conquering king in that day would come in on a horse, not a donkey, a horse was a symbol of power and of war and of victory. A donkey was a symbol of humility and service. And, and Jesus comes in on a donkey. That should have been a telltale sign for them to begin with, right? But we find Jesus coming in on a donkey in a humble way and them lifting him up and celebrating him as a conquering hero. You, you see, there were people in, in their in their history, that they could point to as, as almost being considered divine. Alexander the Great was, was known to be considered divine. He was worshipped as a god. And all of the great accomplishments and victories and all that he conquered, he was worshipped as such. Caesar Augustus, around the time Jesus was born, was in power and he was, in, in many ways, people viewed him as a deity. Because he had brought the world, the known world at the time, to peace. He was a ruler of the empire. And he was celebrated and worshipped as a god in some ways. But Jesus, the true God, the true Messiah, the true Lord, doesn't come to us that way, does he? He comes to us in a humble way. We find him coming to us in the opposite. Why do we have to be lifted up? Why do emperors and heroes and kings have to be worshipped? Why do we even celebrate ourselves and we want to be our own gods in our own lives? Why do we want the praise of men? Why is it that we want to be glorified? It's called the flesh. It's called a result of the sin that began with Adam. And if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, you will notice not just that sin entered the world through Adam and Eve and their action and their disobedience, but it actually illustrates what they did in grasping for something that wasn't rightfully theirs. You see, as mankind, ever since Adam did this in Genesis 3, we're always grabbing at glory. We're always grasping for something that's not rightfully ours. Adam and Eve there in that moment when they had the option, they had the choice to obey God or disobey God, what did Eve do? She took the fruit 
because she wanted to be something more than she was. She wanted a different level of glory. She wanted to be God-like. She wanted to know more and have access to more than what she was created and designed to be. And so she therefore grabbed something that wasn't rightfully hers. She grasped at this glory that she hoped to attain that wasn't hers. And what do we see Jesus do? We see Jesus do the exact opposite of Adam. Jesus lets go of what was rightfully his. Jesus lets go of what was rightfully his glory. He lays down his glory. He lays down and empties himself of his deity. Not, not literally, but in that moment he empties himself of his divine glory and status as God and creator to the lowest depths of, of his creation. I want to draw your attention to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 as we wrap this up. And it's found here where Paul is writing to the Philippian church. And he's encouraging them to have the same mind of Christ Jesus. We find in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2, he says, Let the same mind be in you, that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. Taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, Jesus emptied himself. Jesus humbled himself. Jesus humiliated himself willingly in order to accomplish the mission that God had for him in order to provide the gift of salvation for you and for me. And he did so as a sacrifice, as a willing sacrifice. He, nobody forced him on the cross. Did you know that? Nobody forced Jesus on the cross. Nobody tied him down against his will. Nobody drove those spikes through his hands against his desire. He willingly laid himself there. Not as a victim, but as a victor. Christ did so in victory, willingly. And the only way this could happen was if Christ did this. Because only a sovereign God can do this, can't he? Only a sovereign God is able to lower himself and empty himself and place himself on the cross as a way to save humanity. And you see in this passage the process we that the process take place of Jesus humbling himself, lowering himself, going through the suffering even to the point of the cross. And from that double movement, the the lowering, we see God exalting. You see, on Sunday, a week from today, we celebrate the exalted, risen, living Savior, don't we? We celebrate what we read here in verse 11 that says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and in earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We celebrate that. Amen? We celebrate a risen Lord and we have to look forward to the day which is Easter Sunday which focuses on a living Christ. But before Easter Sunday comes Good Friday. There is no resurrection without his death. There is no empty tomb without the cross of Christ. There is no healing without his stripes. And so as we go through this week, and as we hear the words of the Apostle Paul urging us to be of the same mind 
as Christ. Let the words of Matthew 16, 24 and 25 echo through our minds. If anyone wants to follow me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross. So in that challenge by Paul, in that exhortation by the Apostle Paul to the church, he's challenging us to be of the same mind. If we are followers of Jesus, we are to be willing to follow him in the same way that he led us. Now no one else could do the work that he did. We can't save ourselves and we can't, we can't ride on the colt like he did. We can't put ourselves on the cross like he did and save ourselves. That's not what we can do. But what we can do is we can understand what he did for us and we can follow him by taking our cross and denying ourselves and humbling ourselves and emptying us of ourselves in order that we may follow him faithfully. And identifying, if not connecting with the suffering that he went through and the sacrifice that he endured, that he became, so that we can have an Easter Sunday to celebrate. I want to invite you to stand. And uh, as the worship team comes back to close us in our service today, we sing the song, God of Calvary, reminding us that we serve God who is the Lord, who is the creator of heaven and earth, that sent his son Jesus to Calvary, was willing to suffer Calvary. And as we go through this week, as a Christian people, do you appreciate the gift of your salvation? Do you understand what it cost God to save you? Do you have a connection with the suffering and the, and the sacrifice that Jesus made in order for you to be forgiven and for me to be forgiven? Or do we just continue to follow our own, mind, our own version of Jesus, our own idea of Jesus? You see, it's hard for us because we don't like to serve a God who loses, right? It's hard for us to worship a God who is not on top. But as we close our service, let's bow our heads in prayer.